a pleasure to welcome uh, Sergei Ushakin. He's a professor of anthropology and Slavic languages and literatures at Princeton University. He has conducted field work in the Siberian part of uh, Russia, where he comes from apparently, uh, as well as in Belarus and uh, Kyrgyzstan. His research is uh, concerned with transitional processes and situations from the formation of newly independent national cultures after the collapse of the Soviet Union to post-traumatic identities and hybrid cultural forms. First book, The Patriotism of Despair, Lost Nation and War in Russia, focused on communities of loss and exchange of sacrifices in provincial post-communist Russia. His current uh, project explores Eurasian uh, post-coloniality as a means of uh, effective reformatting of the past and as a form of uh, retroactive victimhood. This should be, sound very familiar to all of us here. Uh, Ushaki's uh, Russian language uh, publication include edited volumes on trauma, family, gender, and masculinity. Professor Ushaki is director of the program of Russian and Eurasian studies at Princeton. We're happy to have you here. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank, you very <clears throat> Thank you very much for the in invitation. It's my second time here, though I was just told that um, I, my first time was in Jerusalem and I was told that that doesn't count. So, yeah, yeah. so I'm really enjoying it. Um, the, the things that we'll be talking about today um, is a part of a book project um, that I've been working on for the last several years. Um, and uh, it, it's based on my fieldwork in Minsk and Bishkek, which is to say in um, Belarus and Kyrgyzstan. Is it, is it okay if I see it? Um, sure. Yeah. And, and I hope you can see the, the, the things. Yes. Right. Okay. So, um, and I'm interested in understanding how uh, these newly independent countries uh, articulate and represent and conceptualize their independence and sovereignty, um, given that they were fundamentally shaped uh, by the Soviet experience. And Belarus and Kyrgyzstan, in this case, are really uh, interesting because the countries never existed in independently, so the Soviet um, influence was really dramatic. The Belarus in particular, um, for those of you, generally, actually, this talk doesn't require any uh, uh, additional knowledge or preconceived knowledge, so it's mostly kind of case studies I will be talking about. But just to give you some ideas, um, so um, from the revolution till the uh, first, uh, Second World War, uh, Belarus kept growing uh, through the several kind of divisions, so it's, uh, and uh, it became much bigger than uh, it was in 1918, so, well, 17, so you could see on, uh, on this map um, the, the progression. But um, during the Second World War, of course, the composition of the population changed dramatically. About a third of the population was um, decimated, so as a result, during uh, the post-war decades, we have a huge um, inflow migration, mostly Russophonic. So by sort of mid-70s, we have the fabric uh, of the population that is quite different, mostly Russophonic, uh, mostly uh, urban, with very little connection to uh, their past, um, to the national past, I mean. So my attempts uh, uh, to approach my, these places through the lenses of postcolonial studies come from the field experiences again, Local intellectuals um, actively evoke ideas and concepts of uh, postcolonial studies. Gayatri Spivak was translated, uh, Homi Baba was translated, some uh, uh, Mignola was translated, and uh, some of them even came uh, to, uh, to Minsk. As in many post-social places, um, they tend to um, emphasize uh, the narratives of victimhood. Um, I'm less interested in that part of um, the um, um, Postcoloniality, um, I'm more interested in understanding the types of subjectivity that postcolonial studies allow us, allow us to grasp. Um, um, and the, the talk today will be mostly about photography. And again, I, I stumbled upon it uh, rather accidentally. A lot of people during uh, the interviews kept talking, uh, kept telling me about uh, the Minsk School of Photography that I never heard of uh, until I, I went there. So eventually I started interviewing those photographers and then gradually over the years I, I accumulated um, a big um, archive of their digital and printed work, so that's what I will be talking about um, today. Okay, so I knew I had to do it, and this is how Andrei Linkevich, um, a visual artist from Minsk, explained to me the history of his um, double heroes. The photograph provoked quite a stir in Belarus when an independent Minsk uh, gallery, there are two uh, in town, um, showed it in 2012 um, as a part of Linkevich's ma massive for the project called Goodbye Motherland. As Linkevich recalled it, uh, the leading philosopher of the Belarusian opposition, Valentina Kudovich, whom I'm quoting there, highly praised the work by saying, finally, someone showed it. 
Other viewers were no less excited, but instead of praising the artist, they threatened to sue him for uh, denigrating the memory of the Second World War. To be honest, Linkevich continued in um, an interview with me in 2014, I really hope that 15 years from now, these double heroes uh, would be on the walls of our national museums because it is a fundamentally important photograph for me and for our society in general. So what is so, fundamental, what is so fundamentally important um, about double, double heroes? The col this color photograph, photograph is a static double portrait of two male soldiers cropped at their waist. Um, the men stare intensely yet patiently um, at something that is located um, on their eye level but beyond the limits of the picture. Their faces look identical, their postures are identical too, their uniforms, uh, while clearly different, also show a strong formal family resemblance. Both men have similar field caps, shoulder straps, rows of metal buttons, and so on. This exercise um, in the formal repetition, however, is radically undermined by two minor elements. The man on the left has a Soviet red star on his field cap, while the man on the right has the German eagle embroidered above his right breast pocket. And like if you enlarge it enough, you'll see that sort of swastika there is car carefully blurred. Um, <laughs> A formal repetition turns out to be a production of an ideological conflict, a visually harmonized combination of existential enemies. But there is a certain calmness, if not coldness, in the way these two men are presented. There is no animosity or even a slight hint of tension in the photograph. In fact, the double portrait delivers a strong objectivist message. It doesn't judge. It just li uh, uh, lists available historical alternatives. Partly, this distancing effect is an outcome of the frame's visual structure. By positioning the soldiers um, diagonally away from each other and away from the viewer, Linkevich transforms the canonical military portrait. The usual theatrical body display in front of the camera and the beholder morphs here into an absorptive, absorptive uh, depiction of the characters looking awry. Just to give you sort of an example of a typical uh, military portrait, it's called Chuck. Um, uh, from this transformation of internal conventions of the portrait genre significantly influences the external perception of the photograph. The skewed orientation of the figures and their skewed outlooks uh, frustrate the possibility of the visual exchange between the eyes of the personages and the eye of the viewer. The visual orientation of the characters is in discord with the position of the viewer who is being forced uh, to divide his or her attention between the two equally uh, meaningful figures. The soldiers are posing, uh, inviting the gaze, but they are not posing for the viewer of the photograph. In fact, they purposefully ignore the viewer. This pictorial disengagement is amplified further by the deliberate erasure of the photographic context. In the photograph, the soldiers are placed against the um, empty off-white background that suggests no vanishing point, which could have provided a, some sense of depth and incorporated the viewer into the picture. The absence of shadows makes the appearance of the double even more decontextualized. Neither from the point of view of its internal geometry, an absent vanishing point, nor from the point of view of, the na of its narrative organization, soldiers looking as cans, does double hero offer a logical entry point into the frame. As a result, the viewer's perspective is fundamentally unsettled. There is no historical context to interpret. There is no clear vantage point to assume. And there is no obvious visual path to complete. Without a clear-cut perspective, the viewer is suspended in a state of an epistemological conf confusion and visual uncertainty. <coughs> Could these double heroes be twin brothers? Are they saying that for each Red Army soldier, one could easily find a local collaborator with the Nazis? Or is this double portrait a portrait of a double agent? And if so, are we supposed to read the repetition as a diachronic transformation of the same person from the communist left to the Nazi right? Is this photograph an allegory of the nation, which is doomed to be stuck with politically incompatible regimes? Or is this a visual meditation on the benefits and pitfalls of survival through acts of transformative mimicry? And whose heroes are the soldiers anyway? In Double Heroes, um, I explore the theme of a neutral scholarly attitude towards the history of the Second World War. Linkevich clarified his analytic approach in a public interview. 
The source of inspiration was, um, uh, for the work was a TV story about uh, historical reenactors in Belarus. As the artist told me, uh, I quote, the majority of these reenactors actually have two full sets of the uniform. One is the fascist and the other one is the Soviet. Depending on the need, they could perform on either side dur during a reenactment. I was completely shocked to see these people being totally neutral in regard to the Second World War. All they could care about was the authenticity of their buttons, the proper shoulder straps, and the exact overall outlook. For them, it made no difference whatsoever which side to fight on. This struck me to the point of sheer madness. Namely, here there is someone who could go and fight uh, the fascists today and the Soviets tomorrow. When Kevich's conflation of history and spectacle of the past and the present is indicative, history is not quite history yet. The war past still plays itself out today and even tomorrow. <coughs> Hence, any attempt to present a reenactment as a playful costume drama is suspicious, if not maddening, and must be neutralized by being reframed in terms of a moral choice or at least its impossibility. Despite his sheer madness, Linkevich painstakingly staged and documented the condition of epistemological indifference of his subject, taking a spectacle of reenacted battle. ability to fit diametrically different uniforms and scenarios without losing face. The fundamental importance of Double Heroes then has to do with at least two crucial moments. First, the photograph usefully visualizes a contemporary trend of anesthetizing painful historical moments through their meticulously choreographed reproductions. The past is decontextualized and isolated. It is reduced to its material indices, buttons, belts, chevrons, and so on. This reduction, however, is not necessarily an operation of simplification. Rather, it is a mode of transcoding. History is approached as a museum of perceptible objects, as a gallery of ready-made pieces, which could be reappropriated, reassembled, and reactivated. In place of memory, there are mnemonic objects. This focus on various aspects of materiality may make possible another dramatic shift from social contexts and social <laughs> relations to textures, colors, shapes, sounds, volumes, and so on. Facts become overshadowed by what Russian avant-garde artists of the 1920s called faktura, that is to say by the tangible characteristics of historical artifacts. As Double Heroes make it clear, what really distinguishes one man from another is neither the individuality of their faces nor the specificity of their surrounding, but the distinctive ornamentalism of their sartorial details. Difference is not a manifestation of some deep essence anymore. It is a result of a relation between the elements on the surface. Secondly, Double Heroes offers um, an important model of subjectivity, both within and outside the frame. And Linkevich's reliance on the genre of the portrait is crucial here. Unlike many forms of mimetic representation, the portrait blurs the distinction between uh, the medium and the object of representation. The usual role of the portrait is to convey in fact, to document visually the referent. However, in the case of Double Heroes, the careful realism of the photograph exploits the conventions of the portrait only to radically subvert it from within. By doubling the face, Linkevich transforms it into a placeholder. Creating the surplus of the individual, the duplication effectively functions as its erasure. Or to be more precise, the method of duplication works here as an operation of unmasking. Medic realism results in semantic capacity. No differential relationship between the two faces could be easily established. This defacement as in masking does suggest a certain double, double logic though. The doubling of the face could be read as a pictorial articulation of the idea that there is no self prior to a socially demarcated existence. In other words, without the signifying stamp of the uniform, all faces are alike. That could be, of course, um, an opposite interpretation, too. The reappearing face is a symbol of the ontological constancy that deprives signs of political belonging from any referential quality. 
Uniforms are just examples of camouflaging outfits easy to replace during the masquerade of survival. In other case, the semantic ambivalence of the face in Double Heroes provides a structural possibility for the comparative analysis of the two figures. Through transforming the facial features in, into a repeatable formula, the act of defacement highlights the individual's ability to serve as a corporeal vehicles, a vehicle for a comparable ideological science. The traditional balance between the epistemic and the pictorial that characterizes the portrait is completely shattered in this photograph. The portrait genre is utilized not to represent the referent, but to materialize its non-transparency, if not absence. If holding any hints of a solution for the depicted dilemma, Linkevich's uh, heroes leave the story about the constitutive duality of the portrait open. They draw our attention to epistemological and identificatory possibilities that might reside in constant oscillation between the alternatives and various techniques of non-alignment and in diverse practices of the dispassionate embodying of historically available shapes. Reproducing historical formulas and visual cliches, Linkevich objectifies the past. The semantic capacity of the photograph is used as a foundation for building a complex syntax of visual relations, relations between the viewer and the double portrait. Double heroes is a form of reported speech, a deliberate exercise in practicing a borrowed language. So using Linkevich's double heroes as my point of departure, in the remaining uh, time, I will analyze a specific technology of self-objectification and self-presentation that took shape in Belarus before and after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I will be dealing with the work, uh, works of two prominent contemporary photographers, um, uh, Sergei Kazimiakin and Igor Savchenko, who are associated with the so-called Minsk School of Creative Photography, which emerged in the end of the 1980s. In both cases, the photographers built their archives by actively transforming visual materials of the Soviet period, their art is the art of recycling, the art of working with ready-mades. So I'm interested in studying various techniques of post-colonial appropriation through, through which Minsk photographers and visual artists critically reclaimed and refocused visual languages of the Soviet past. I'll, I will refer to this technology as vicarious photogra photography to make apparent both the ready-made nature of its sources and the type of indirect and unmasked subjectivity that it, it portrays. <laughs> The vicarious, borrowed, and appropriated nature of these visual sources is important. In fact, it nicely reflects the overall problem of the process of decolonization aptly formulated by Franz Fanon more than 60 years ago. Fanon right, uh, wrote uh, back then, whether he likes it or not, the black man has to wear the livery the white man fabricated for him. More recently, Gayatri Spivak translated the same problem into the language of representation. Her famous question, can the subaltern speak, emphasized the fact that the vocabulary of expressive forms available to the subaltern classes tends to be underprivileged. Also, and more significantly, to be heard, to be understood, subaltern groups are forced to speak the language of the institutions and regimes that dominate them. To put it differently, delivery has to be appropriated in order to be transformed from within. The visual materials allow me to trace um, how a particular historical experience fights against the limits of already existing genres. Visual interventions do not happen in the vacuum. They tend to be constrained by the available vocabulary of expressive forms, plot structures, syntactic, syntactic conventions, and so on. So in my case, the enabling and constraining framework is the genre of the individual or group portrait. Yet, as I, I just showed it with um, Double Heroes, Portraits could be evoked not to individualize the depicted personality, but to deface this individual. And as I claim, uh, this defacing appropriation has a certain narrative, con uh, narrative coherence. Images of decapitated or faceless individuals point to a particular form of presence without identification. They visualize subjectivity without agency, but with a lot of self-reflexivity. So I will try to show to repeat Lisitsky that I quote there um, how Belarusian photographers circle, circle around the portrait, that is to say how they reproduce and at the same time transform the livery that they inherited. So let's, let's do some um, mental um, exercise. Try to imagine, I will describe a picture and sort of try to um, envision it in your mind. Imagine it. A man uh, in, um, in his middle ages, um, in the military uniform, poses for the camera. 
He stands in the corner of an open terrace um, somewhere high in the Crimean mountains with the sea far below. One of his hands um, firmly holds the terrace's railing. The other is casual, casually placed on his waist. The photo, photo is perfectly composed. The horizontal low, uh, rows of the railings are structurally um, balanced by the vertical of the officer's body. And this scene in the background merges with the sky, creating a seamless airy plane. The portrait um, would have been a typical example of a holiday picture from a summer resort, except for one crucial detail that is missing, the man's head. The figure is cropped right at the officer's shoulder. Yet despite this violent erasure of the subject, the photograph is disturbingly serene. Relaxed, if headless, the figure exudes confidence and even a sense of control. So imagine, is it something like that? The photo is called Presence, Prisutstvia, and it is a part of the series called A Family Album by the Minsk photographer Sergei Kazimiakin. In my interview with him in Minsk, I asked why he decided to decapitate the officer. He insisted that there was no alteration whatsoever. I would never allow myself to cut the head of my brother off, and suggested his own reading of the image. In 1989, when he started working on the album Presence, Prisutstvia, was a term routinely used to refer to the Soviet invasion um, in Afghanistan as in the presence of a limited army contingent, Prisutstvia Granichino Contingenta. Kazimek confused a political cliche with the ready-made image of his brother, a military officer, um, offering a play with a stereotype, as he called it. His playful appropriation transformed the mechanical cut by the camera into a conceptual tool of sorts, the confidence self-presentation of the body, unencumbered by the presence of mind, created a visual allegory for the unpopular and badly conceived military invasion. The image was certainly a certificate of presence as Roland Bard um, defined photography, but this present, uh, presence certified the absence of the subject. It was a presence that made identification with the depicted individual quite impossible. There is another type of absence that this re-photographed re portrait conveyed. Kazimiakin's own authorial presence in the production of this photograph is strikingly immaterial. He activates a visual record of the past without leaving any, any traces of his own intervention. The visual record of the past is reenacted but not appropriated. The author pr pr prefers to stay outside the frame, dealing with history from a distance. This retrospective activation of the photographic record captures well the techniques of figuration that were elaborated by visual uh, artists of the Minsk School of Photography before and after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The emptied subjects, defaced but camouflaged, presented subjectivity as a vocabulary of poses and costumes that could deliver their sem semantic effect even when the identity of the performer could not be established. Because of its vicarious nature, this second-hand photography draws attention not to the expressive, but to the editorial capacities of the vicarious photographer. Found photographs are selected, combined, and visually transformed, producing a post-factum archive of the period that is gone. Such postcolonial archives rely on visual analogs of reported speech, demonstrating their constitutive dependency on uh, pre-mediated forms of expression. The derivative quality of this visual production uh, vividly exposes the paraphrasing devices such as refocalization, resequencing, recomposing, or tonal flattening, and I will be talking about that in a minute, through which the available historical records are recaptured. In a sense, they offer us a set of techniques of dealing with the past that cannot be completely erased or rewritten. The interventions are done from within, but their effect nonetheless is crucial for undermining the original conventions of representation. Bill Ashcroft, a scholar of uh, postcolonial studies in Latin America, um, usefully observes that the colonized culture could absorb dominant forms by, quote, making them bear, bear the burden of a different experience. Such tactical occupations, as he called them, deploy dominant representations against their culture of origin in order to control frames and forms of self-representation. So let me go back to Kazimierz's album to show how he performs this art of tactical occupation. As I mentioned, the family album is based on ready-made photographs, um, and its subtitle, Real Photographs from Real Life, 1953-1989, 
pointedly emphasize the documentary quality of these instances of reported speech. All the original photos were found um, in the archives of Kazimierz's parents and his brother. In the series, he assumes a position of externality vis-a-vis -vis the genre and history. His own authorial presence is not manifested directly, but the photographs that he carefully selected do expose the work of the photographic medium. The framing and structural intrusions of the camera are hard not to notice. It is indicative that Kazimierz rejected the usual organization, uh, organizational conventions of the family album. The real life in the album that he curated is not structured by the linear chronology. There is no diachronic progression whatsoever. Nor does it trace a biography of a particular individual. This real life ostensibly lacks leading heroes and recognizable historical events. Moreover, close-up portraits of relatives, the dominant genre of a typical family album actually, are entirely missing. Instead, the series presents uh, snapshots of family everyday scenes in which people are photographs, uh, photographed from a distance and often from, um, from above. Their faces are not usually disfigured, um, but they do not act as logical focal points of the photos either. Instead, the photographer's, photographer's gaze focuses on peripheral elements. Uh, the gaze is purposefully uh, diffused. And if you see this picture, it's sort of hard to see from afar. Uh, but um, uh, there, are, there is just not one troika. There are several. Um, three, three, three. So in other words, like, to understand what the picture does, sort of, like, your, your gaze has to sort of travel uh, around the, um, the whole um, surface of it. So, in a sense, this album of ready-made photographs presents a particular view of um, history that celebrates the, uh, the eccentric and the marginal. To give you another example. I want to emphasize, though, that res this resistance to cohere and the avoidance of any thematic or temporal commitment that the al uh, family album highlights are not random. They are carefully planned aesthetic effects of Kazimierz's compositional strategy. They are indeed expressions um, of post-colonial post presence in which the imperial past is rarely perceived as a sequence of frontal portraits organized in narrative progression, for instance, like in this one. History neither gels nor crystallizes here, but it makes itself available indirectly, obliquely, fragmentary, and often out of focus. So what we see in this album on the structural level is a productive embrace of the method of duplication. However, the coping and the, and the replication of ready-made artifacts do not reconfirm the equivalence with the copied original. The duplication does not reinforce, reinforce the continuity with the original source. Instead, the doubling introduces an unsettling ambiguity. Another work by Kazimierz and his transformation of an image uh, from 1988 shows this especially well. Technically, the photograph is not a portrait as such, uh, or rather it is a serial portraiture of a canonic monument of standing Vladimir Lenin. Four copies of the same photograph were developed separately before they were assembled and re-photographed um, as a single image. So we have multiple duplication. And I should mention, uh, actually, uh, all these photographs have been done uh, before the um, arrival of Photoshop, right? So it's all kind of digitally, um, um, it's, it, uh, it's, uh, it's from the pre-digital epoch, from pre-digital period. So they had to do it kind of manually. Sort of, there is a lot of engagement, sort of manual engagement with these um, um, uh, uh, shots. So the compositional structure of transformation is deceptively transparent. A thin white grid neatly brings together and isolates four identical segments in which a vertical figure of Lenin functions as the visual and semantic focus. In spite of the organizing grid, uh, changes in light and density of each frame are not linear. This sequence image uh, suggests no obvious way to begin, though it is tempting to read the composition as a progression from the bright days of Leninism to its twilight. The differential toning of the empty space is minimalist in its technique, but it's crucial in its impact. The tonal modification of the segment uh, gradually flattens the sculpture. As the shadows become more and more leveled, the three-dimensional Lenin loses its depth and becomes a cardboard thin silhouette. From being referential, Lenin quickly devolves into being simulacral, and all because of the change of tone. These tonal changes are not just semantic. Changes of tone suggest a new trajectory of reading too. To maintain its meaning, each iteration of the sculpture must be read differentially now. 
against and along the sculptures and contexts in um, the other segments. The disentering effect of this transformation is even more pronounced when the series is approached as a single frame. In the center of the series, there is a void cross pointedly emphasized by intersecting lines of the white grid. As the compositional structure of transformation suggests, the spatial center neither generates nor anchors the explanation for the series anymore. In order to understand the composition, one has to approach it eccentrically. This image ha 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 uh, helpfully foregrounds the importance of the open deployment of the semantic and the artistic potentials of the photographic surface. The surface is converted here into an autonomous tool of expression, or to put it slightly differently, the surface became transform transformed into a multi-layered visual screen that could display signs of the process of the appropriation of the medium. We see how the livery is getting deconstructed through various forms of ornament and embroidery. The subaltern fi finds a formal way to indicate traces of its presence. So to appreciate fully the importance of this visual claim to authorial presence without identity, I want to, to make a quick recourse to the work of the German artist um, Gerhard Richter. His appropriation of documentary media, first of all photography, could be seen as a crucial historical predecessor of the visual series uh, that I explore. But when I ask um, the photographers whether they knew any, any, any works of Richter or some other contemporary um, uh, artists, foreign artists, they said no. So who knows? So uh, Richter's famous um, um, Uncle Rudy is particularly significant here. Um, the portrait is an example of Richter's uh, handmade photographs. It is a painting that painstakingly uh, reproduced the photographic original. In, Al in Uncle Rudy, the artist depicted in 1965 his real um, relative, his, his uncle. In the uniform of the German Wehrmacht, Wehrmacht, can say that, Rudy occupies the center, center of the picture smiling at the camera. The painting is mimetic, but it's not transparent, like literally. Richter scrubbed with a dry brush the surface of uh, the almost kind of dry painting in order to subvert the photorealism of um, the almost finished work. The blur that emerged in the process of this scrubbing obfuscates the clarity of the message and creates a ghostly image of an awkwardly grinning Nazi officer. Benjamin Buchlo, um, a Harvard scholar of Richter, suggests that Richter used this distortion of Uncle Rudy to respond to the historically specific impediment, as he called them. The blur helped to avoid the conflict between the necessity of constructing historical memory and the inadequacy of uh, the rational means available to do this. Uncle Rudy's obscurity, um, in other words, was an attempt to render the horror of the Nazi past not by constructing an adequately horrific visual narrative, but by deliberately disorganizing the very process of visual narration. In a sense, as many scholars pointed out, Richter constructed a substitute for the social debate that never occurred. There are several important parallels between the Richter's Uncle Rudy and the Minsk ph photography that I've discussed. In both cases, we are dealing with, the wo with works that rely on reproduction of ready-made artifacts, photographs, or sculptures. In both cases, we, the pictorial content was purposefully obfuscated through blurring, texturing, or toning. The conventions of the portrait genre were similarly evoked only to be imploded by erasing the subjectivity or by defacing the subject. In both cases, the artists avoided the narrative closure. The burden of interpretation was shifted onto the viewer. And finally, each case emerged as a quiet confrontation that challenged the problematic social conditions in which the question of historical culpability and individual responsibility was barely heard. So by drawing these parallels, I am far from suggesting a historical equivalence between the Richter's post-Nazi situation and, and Belarus, Belarus post-colonial condition. The unrepresentable that each case was trying to negotiate was very different. But I do think that the similarity of formal engagements with the past that could be neither transformed nor overcome underscores the same ba basic ontological problem. When the necessity to represent historical experience colonial or otherwise, is constrained by the inadequacy of representational tools, one might embrace these tools to expose their inadequacy. Such so purposeful combination of semantic minimal minimalism and representational deficiency uh, reached the most developed form in the work of Igor Savchenko, who was born in 1962, and uh, Kazimierkin is slightly older, he was born in 58, I think. 
uh, Savchuk is probably the most prominent visual artist from Minsk. Uh, his visual work brings together major aspects of dealing with history through second-hand sources that I've been uh, tracing so far. He also works in series um, as, or cycles, as he, as he calls them, which present a highly eccentric view of the past. They also, the cycles also reject any attempt to point to the historical depth. Instead, they surf history and historical documents. On the one hand, the photographic surface becomes a platform uh, for interaction, but also many individuals are reduced to their material surface, surfaces. For instance, their clothing, delivery, replaced disappearing subjectivity. Savchenko's works are a perfect example of reported speech. All original materials, the photographs from 1930s and 1960s, were found or bought. However, Savchenko's works are not duplicative. He is a reporter and an actant at the same time. He reproduces the visual discourse of the past, but in the process of this reproduction, he shifts the direction of the discussion. Like Kazimiakin, he avoids frontal confrontations with um, visual records and appropriates them in a somewhat slanted way, situating himself in the field of visual action indirectly, but quite prominently. He uses um, standard textual gestures, blurring or scratching, but he also submits found originals to various forms of optic, again, pre-digital transformations. For instance, he, could, he would enlarge and crop a particular segment multiple times so that a minor detail from the original could reemerge as a new focal center of the visual story. In other cases, figures could be lifted from different sources and recombined in a single frame through multiple exposures. The appropriation of the ready-made visual stock works as a process of alteration here. It is crucial that these vicarious techniques usually do not retrofit the representational remains of the past with contemporary content, as was, for instance, so common uh, for many photographic projects in Russia in the 1990s. And I wrote about this. There was a whole kind of wave of projects when um, celebrities would be retrofitted into sort of famous uh, pictorial um, examples. Like in this case, or like um, um, this one is a famous rock star like as Durer, and uh, this one is, of course, Rembrandt with all the political figures. What is interesting here, like sort of, they, they do claim kind of the, the, the position. Um, uh, Makarevich, uh, this uh, rock star, when asked about the portrait, said, like, yeah, that's me, right? Even like, of course, like, it's not. But, so you don't see that at all, like sort of this kind of attempt to claim the history, uh, the, uh, on the previous historical frames which is absent in, in Minsk. So it is crucial. Uh, that these vicarious techniques in Minsk um, usually do not treat, as I said, like sort of, uh, do not retrofit uh, representational remains uh, um, of the past. The postcolonial appropriation works differently. The reappropriation of historical frames in vicarious photography is not synonymous to the appropriation of history. Control over the process of representation is discovered in the method of revision and recomposition. So breaking the analogous relationship between images and their subjects, this form of appropriation undermines the basic assumption about photography's ability to lead us back to the body that created the imprint, as Christopher Pini um, put it. So it is indicative um, that Savchenko cycles offer no individualized information about portrayed subjects at all. Right? Anonymity is the default, default choice here. History is approached mostly as an assemblage of decontextualized historical types, outlines or imprints. He doesn't date the original of his cycles either. Instead, he signs the transformed image and indicates uh, the year when the frame was reappropriated or rather reauthored. Similarly, it is impossible to tell whether individual photographs of a cycle were derived from the same original or were taken from different sources. All traces of possible pictorial kinship were meticulously suppressed. The final images do not reveal their roots. The past, Savchenko seems to suggest, is not about origin. The second-hand photographic records are torn out of their temporal and historical settings and reclassified under whimsical rubrics, like alphabet of gestures, shadows, faceless, mysteria, about love, about happiness, and so on. Externally imposed narrative axes reorganize newly recorded historical traces, suggesting a highly curated vision of the past. In an interview in, 19, uh, in 2014, I asked him about the ready-made aspects of his visual art and the temporal limits of his sources. The answer was unexpected. I, I tried to push him and ask like, about the nostalgic quality of this project. He said no. 
Um, as a photographer, he explained he could never succeed in capturing things that I quote would interest him. His own photography, he admitted, was missing something fundamental. Something was not quite present in it. So he kept looking. He kept looking for something that would appeal to him. In the old photographs, he continued, there are faces, relations, and some kind of connection between people that really touch me. I'm not sure you could see that around anymore. Ready-made photographs were appealing because they were static, he said. They were from a different time, from the epoch that, was complete, that had been completed. They come from a period which is not too remote. And because of this historical proximity, they are not too alien. At the same time, because of their historical distance, they are not too close to your own life. They still have their own, their own aura, as he put it. Savchenko's explanation outlined the core aspect of vicarious photography in the post-colonial archive. The indirect quality affords an effective experience of a shared sense of historical continuity. But simultaneously, it offers a safe distance from which this ready-made past could be subjected to various manipulations. For instance, the cycle shadow, um, Tenia, Tenia 1999-1993, consists of a set of toned photographs in which individuals or groups are placed within the empty, grainy environment. In some cases, Savchenko punctuates the photographic space with flat, dark figures borrowed from other images to create a graphic sequence of almost identical silhouettes. In others, the frame could be occupied by only one um, individual facing a blank space. Shadows of history, indeed. These anonymous uh, bodies turn the past into a landscape of ghostly somatic outlines into space populated by recognizably human contours, but unrecognizable individuals. Again, uh, figuration here is purposefully not self-explanatory. There is no pretense of referential representation here. Instead, in shadows, Savchenko uses photographic records of the past to show us that records are not history, but only traces that manage to survive, and often by accident. If Shadows presented a photographic version of Plato's cave, suggesting to see in history nothing more than a collection of corporeal imprints of unknown origin, then his next series, Alphabet of Gestures, used anonymous, anonymous somatic configurations to approach history as a very tactile, haptic experience. Alphabet turns peripheral elements of the portrait into the center of attention. Savchenko shifts our gaze to the margins, and by doing this, he's able to reveal the nuanced choreography of human limbs, usually overshadowed by more noticeable facial expressions. When seen together, Alphabet's gestures offer a strange body spectacle, familiar and alienating at the same time. The photographic fragments have clearly came, uh, come from um, static public portraits. However, in their defaced and magnified incarnations, these hieroglyphs of extremities suddenly convert the alphabet of gestures into an archive of a voyeur, as if disclosing the fetishistic nature of our desire to approach the historical detail too closely. Six, cycle, six cycles of Savchenko's mysterious traveling between the flattening distance of shadows and the fetishistic obsession of alphabets. In the series, Savchenko used overpainting in addition to his usual cropping and refocusing. For example, this uh, Mysteria One from uh, the end of the 1980s contains a set of portraits in which red dots or red lines were drawn over people's faces or in their backgrounds. Savchenko told me in an interview that he used paint to highlight already existing cracks and scratches of the original photographs. As he put it, I quote, for me, these defects of the originals were traces of time, traces of those forces and those elements of the period. There was something powerful going on back then, hence the red color as the most appropriate in my view. The overpainting, in other words, is not only a way of retracing history, but also it is a way of establishing a haptic connection with it. It is a form of access to the past and, at the same time, a tool of editorial control over it. Some images had a handwritten sequence, um, uh, sentence caption at the bottom of the margin, so like this one. In the end, sir, these interventions result in an intricate palimpsest of layers of appropriation. So we have a cropped image from an acquired, um, of an acquired photograph which has been painted over, narrativized, signed, and redated below. Right? 
What this layering allows Savchenko to achieve then is a non-committal relation with the past that is kept at a distance and at the same time is being imprinted with marks of adoption. This adoption is more formal than substantive and the alleged caption, like for instance, yes, of course, but it doesn't mean that the last judgment doesn't exist, helps little to clarify the nature of the artist's intervention. But like the red paint, it chronicles the act of intervention. If the ready-made nature of the vicarious photograph effaced the authorial self, then multiple tactical occupations of the photographic surface reinstate the authorial presence in an untransparent and obfuscating way. It is useful to contrast Sachinka's work and his explanation with another painting by Gerhard Richter, somewhat similar from the point of view of its technical characteristic. Richter's Pari from 1963 is a painted reproduction of, of a photograph from an illustrated magazine in which four glamorous women and a man drink punch smiling at the camera. While recreating the photograph, Richter substantially corrected uh, the original. In the painting, people are covered with bloody scars. And the scars are not merely illusionistic. They are physical cuts in a canvas, which have been stapled, stitched, and painted over with um, bright red. Analyzing the painting, Eckhart Gillen, um, a scholar of him, um, Richter, reads slashes and bloody additions in Pari as an example of what he called capitalist realism, as materialized signs of Richter's critical distancing from the content that he recreated. Savchenko's painterly interventions do not seem to have any obvious critical message. His overpainting refocalizes the image not by offering uh, a counter-narrative, but by, by, by amplifying the factura of the time. In his, enhancing his authorial presence, he retraces the elemental forces of the period, bringing them uh, to the fore within the frame of the borrowed image. What Richter's work helps to illuminate then is a different status of borrowed formations in the project of the Minsk School. The goal of vicarious photo appropriation is not to alienate found objects pictorially, but to use them as vehicles of substitutive presence. And finally, faceless, the last and my, um, my favorite actually um, uh, cycle. It brings together uh, multiple techniques of the scopic revisioning of the past. The cycle includes individual portraits, like this one, uh, in which faces of individuals are completely hollowed out. Also, there are mini-series mini in which individuals disappear gradually, one after another, and I'll just show you one. So that's the starting one. Well, there is nothing particularly sinister about um, overall compositions of the graphic contents of faceless images. The traces of disappearance do produce a disturbing effect. Facial erasure, erasures are not complete. People hair, for instance, um, remains. And um, the spaces of surgically executed non-presence look like entry points into another dimension beyond the picture. The disappeared demand uh, for explanation, but there would be none not even in the form of a usually obfuscating caption. Removing traces of interiority, Savchenko leaves these negative spaces open for each and any interpretation. When several um, works from the cycle were exhibited abroad, in, like in the US, uh, curators tended to see in them a reminder of Stalinism, of all those people and representations that were made um, uh, d to disappear. And i just give you a couple of examples. That's from um, 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 an album that Rochenko put together. It's called like, 10 Years of Uzbekistan. And um, the guy, um, um, Akmal Ikramov, who was the head of the Communist Party of Uzbekistan, uh, the book came out in 34. Um, and uh, the guy was arrested and then killed in uh, 38. And Rochenko, it's from his own um, 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 copy, he marked, marked it out. And so he did so gradually with uh, many portraits um, in this book. So during our conversation um, in Minsk, Savchenko completely dismissed this kind of interpretations uh, as having nothing in common with his own intention, as he put it. These people are faceless, uh, he said, um, because they are human models. They present different models of, of people in different life situations. Therefore, there are no faces, just mother as such, that type, or child as such, that types. The cycle is about a universal human being, человек вообще. I had no reason uh, not to believe him. After all, when in, 19, in the late 20s, early 30s, Malevich was forced to abandon his cubes and circles, he switched to producing peasants, peasants, girls, and people of the future, who 
whose identities were similarly hollowed out, faceless and de-individualized, they were also supposed to represent universal human types and social categories, shells to inhibit, inhabit models to emulate. Unlike Malevich's generalized people of the future, Savchenko's universal beings of the past were not imagined. They were distilled and abstracted from historical records. His universal beings are decontextualized and anonymized, but they did offer templates of the inhabitable past by pointing to experiences, situations, and relations that did take place. What Savchenko outlines in his cycle, then, is a collection of modalities that make the ready-made history accessible for changes and open for interactions. Through operations of fragmentation and recomposition, he refocused historical records. He also reactivated the available past by defacing its subjects and retracing its elemental forces. His art of tactical occupation did not produce an alternative version of history, but I think it did something more important. It envisioned Soviet history as a, as a space of new formal possibilities. More generally, as the visual archive of the Minsk School demonstrates, the appropriation of visual conventions of the Soviet period does not necessarily result in their duplication. Nor does this appropriation require the mandatory ironic position. The visual artists whom I discuss employ the visual language of the Danish Empire in order to dis disassociate themselves from the Soviet practices of uh, uh, photographic recording. Of course, there is a danger in replacing photography as a tool of documentary recording with photography as a speculative practice, which uses historical forms for building a foundation for hypothetical versions of the past. There is a clear threat of what T.J. Demos defined as, a, a quote, the near complete disconnection of photography from social reality. Lived experience now appears merely as a secondary effect of the photograph's own creative fabrication. As I have tried to show, such disconnection does not have to take a shape of a flight from reality, though. As the visual archive of the Minsk School demonstrates, this distancing could also provide a necessary opening for generating forms of critical engagement with available for the objects left behind by the vanished empire. Through erasing subjectivity and abstracting imprints of lived experience, the vicarious photography articulated a model of dealing with history that allowed presence without identity or identification. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, it has to be decontextualized, but um, there is only so much I could do in one talk. Um, and I have written uh, on, um, uh, on other forms of uh, dealing with the past, um, um, like the book I'm writing sort of, um, um, is about that. So what we see here, and the reason why I'm interested in this in particular, is um, that it goes against the um, uh, emerging tendencies. One of them is a complete erasure of uh, the Soviet past. So there is uh, a lot of an engagement, involvement, an investment rather, in presenting and by passing the history by going back to the beginning of the century uh, when in 1919 
Belarus had like four months of independence when the German uh, troops were there. So there is this attempt sort of to present the Soviet past as something that uh, was a mistake, as something that uh, didn't matter or didn't have any uh, re uh, repercussions or effect. In this case, so... Sort of so Soviet past is just past. They don't have any other past. That's the only past they have. Not quite true, um, because another, um, uh, another trend, a very strong one, is to revitalize the past of, uh, that they like. Namely, uh, a lot of intellectuals are talking all the time about the great duchy of Lithuania as an example of sovereignty that they could have had. And like, I, I spent a, a lot, I don't know how much of you know, uh, of you know about that, but I spent a lot of hours listening to these narratives, how every Belarusian had a castle and that kind of sort of nice stories. Right, so in this case, we don't have that. Right. In this case, sir, we have um, uh, an engagement with the past that doesn't amount to its erasure, but still it's a rel relatively critical one. So they are trying sort of, to, in, in, to locate themselves in the past without completely sort of, holding it out. And that's what I find quite productive. And of course, like, <coughs> you need also to read against <coughs> the um, intellectual production that is happening at the same time. So um, the one uh, study that I really liked there was, uh, one trend was, um, an attempt to develop the so-called uh, studies of Belarusians as a Creole, um, um, uh, cre not quite culture, but as a, cre as a Creole uh, phenomenon, right? So it didn't go too far, precisely because sort of, like, it confronted with the really strong uh, tendency to build a new nation state. So this, this is deliberately non-ethnic, non-national, and that's what, why I find it quite interesting. It could be anyone. Well, I don't know. I mean, so like when you have um, uh, this um, engagement with the second-hand material, suddenly, so there is a pattern. I don't see it in Russia. It could be there, but it's not there. <coughs> yes, please. Uh, thank you. Just, just, just introduce yourself before you ask. Sure. Uh, my name is Kana and I want to ask you about um, your use of the post-colonial framework. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of thought that it was a little bit of um, livery that you're, you're adopting in order to transcend or transform. That is, it's not, it's not Franz Fanon exactly, as far as I could see it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understand that this is different than the retrofitting that you've written about earlier. It's less ironic, it's more sincere. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure, I, don't, I, didn't see the, um, I didn't see the clear power structure that um, I, I think I, I associate with the post-colonial framework. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly not this, the outward signs of evidence or the skin color means. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, from what you said in the beginning, and also about the, 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 uh, the immigration in the 70s and, and, and mm -hmm. just now about this also sort of slightly equally imagined history about the Duke of Lithuania. And the, I, um, can you just say more about how that, how that works and are you using that in a traditional way? I mean, what's, mm -hmm. what's going on with post-colonial? Well, you, you can, I mean, partly uh, uh, the reason why I started using it, um, uh, post-colonial approach, is because they, they're talking about this. Uh, they're talking about decolonization, anti-colonization, and this kind of thing. So I cannot ignore it. But um, they, the way they use it, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, is um, I kind of, it doesn't strike me as a very productive name, so like it's mostly about victimhood, right? Um, you can't use uh, the post-colonial theory as we know it. Um, you can't apply it kind of wholesale to the, uh, the region, partly because the empire was very different, the colonization was very different. So you don't have, uh, because the, we, we tend kind of to take as a norm the uh, form of the empire that is the overseas empire. Here we are mostly dealing with kind of version of kind of settlers colonialism, where the distinction between the colonized and the colonized is often pretty blurred. So you kind of it's, so as a result, I think the postcoloniality would be the same when the past is not clearly marked as colonial or uh, anti-colonial or imperial, right? So they have to deal with this. They have kind of to negotiate and figure out sort of which past is theirs they would like to pick and which one they want to reject, and that's why sort of. I'm try, trying to show this model, right, kind of when they, they appropriate the framework, but they feel sort of more comfortable with erasing some parts of the content. So they're still looking for the framework because sort of they don't, apparently they don't have one of their own, or at least like there is nothing uh, easily available yet, right? So that sense of postcoloniality allows me kind of to highlight precisely this, this kind of presence without identification. That kind of, I, I, I like to play with this idea, right? So still uh, you need to demarcate, you need to present, you need to borrow, you need to wear this livery. Right, but it doesn't mean that sort of delivery could not be 
reconstructed from within. So the buttons, the chevrons, like, are your own. So, so, so my point is, so like, you're trying kind of to uh, deconstruct uh, gradually, patch by patch, the slivery. So we can't afford, or you don't have means to completely reject it right away. So but, is but, it their term or yours? Delivery? The, the, the it's theirs. No, I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like, for instance, sort of they invited Mignola, who writes a lot, a lot about decolonization. So they translated some of his pieces. And then they made a round table around it. And so, and, but if you read it, it's published so in Russian and in English. But if you read it, it's kind of interesting. So uh, Mignola tells, like in his sort of works on decolonization, saying, like, well, look, like, we shouldn't be taking the European majority as sort of the only way to think about ourselves. And he goes on and on and on, saying that sort of we could go back to you know, the indigenous um, ontologies and that kind of stuff. Right. So and then there's a discussion by Belarusian scholars who are saying, like, well, actually, we need to go back to Europe. When I asked Mignola, do you realize, Mignola doesn't read Russian, of course, when I asked him, so do you realize how they, re they interpret your work? No, he doesn't. So like, he has no ideas about that. No, no is he interested, right? But so for them, it's interesting. So like, they borrow certain parts, so the insistence on, on decolonization, for instance, from the Soviet experience, or I don't know, from the Polish experience, right? But at the same time, the ultimate goal is yet another form of incorporation into a larger structure that is not theirs, right? And of course, like, sorry, we have a situation where decolonization there cannot be Marxist, or post-colonial studies could not be Marxist, certainly like, extremely not anti-Marxist. So it's this yet another sort of can of worms that I didn't touch, right? So, but they do appropriate the uh, terminology, right? And it's the same sort of, for me, it's again, it's the same instance of a, a reported speech when you borrow the language, but you kind of, you transform it from within. So it's a very particular, like to give you another example that might work better, uh, you might have heard of uh, uh, Svetlana Alexievich, right? So um, uh, who got, what, a couple of years ago, Nobel Prize. And she works exactly in the same way, right? It's a reported speech that she montages in a very nice way kind of to make her own point. So the speech is not yours, right? The forms of expression are not yours. The tools are not yours, but the message is. And that's what I find really interesting. And that's what I can't quite see, for instance, in my work on uh, Russian materials. Sorry, I'm talking for too long. <laughs> yes. Nico. Um, two sets of questions. One is, I, it's a very interesting opinion, but to me, it's almost like a miracle because I don't understand the traditional possibility. Perhaps you can say more about that. Because it's, it's a very political, but puzzles one, I'm sure, is that to a large extent, this is the intervention in that history. He's very knowledgeable of art history, mm -hmm. and frankly, he is more relevant to artists, to uh, philosophers of art and art historians than to politicians, but I don't care that much about them. Now, you imply, I'm not sure that uh, the relevant photographers uh, do not uh, reflect on their move as a move in the history of photography mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. history of art. And even less so, I understand its um, possible reception in the post-Soviet space to be still very socialist, socialist realist. And again, it's not aware of the Stutzi Western trends in uh, trauma material deconstruction. So I don't, I, I would like to hear more about how it flies in, in, in mm -hmm. I'll leave myself to that. Um, conditions of possibility, um, I did mention that, but um, it's interesting, all these guys were, um, I mean, they're roughly from the same generation, except for Linkevich, who is much younger, he was born, the, the very first image I started with, Double Heroes, he was born in 1982. Uh, uh, but the older ones, the ones who started them in School of Photography, um, originally they actually were all, uh, most of them were um, engineers, and then sort of they, they would photograph on, on the side, and they all attended a, a photo kruzhok for, for the studio. Um, in the uh, 80s where they learned like techniques and stuff like that and um, they actually had some access to, at least like they, they claim, uh, they had access to photo journalists like on photo art mostly via the Baltic states like um, um, I think um, uh, Latvian uh, journals of photography were popular at the time and it, it's very kind of um, creative photography so like you know landscapes or figures, blurred figures so this is very different so it's kind of documental. So they had some knowledge and with the perestroika with them, uh, the, the, the glassness they all abandoned their, um, their jobs and became professional photographers. 
So they do, uh, I don't know, wedding photography, but uh, at the same time they're doing that. Um, there, are very, there were very few exhibits, but um, in the, from the end of the 1990s and throughout the first decade, these uh, photographs that I showed to you, they became really quite ubiquitous. So pretty much every uh, photographic show um, in, the, in the city opens with Kazimierkin's pieces. Savchenko is as big as it gets like in, in the country. So they are popular and the, the work clearly, their work clearly has some appeal. In, even Savchenko stopped uh, taking photographs um, after 97. So perhaps you could say a few words about that, how people read those works. It seems that in the natural, also immediate, uh, immediate environment, people were seeing them as some sort of statement, which is not just artistic. Or am I wrong? Am I wrong? Well, it could be, but... Um, was, it, was it just an artistic statement that you look at it as any sort of, say, abstract art? It could be. I mean, I didn't do that kind of ethnography, but uh, I'm, I'm not, I mean, there are sort of critical essays where sort of people are making similar points, but not about post-coloniality, but rather about sort of the critique of social surrealism. Uh, or some, there are some um, uh, curators who think that that's your typical postmodernist art, which does make it very interesting as a claim, right? So, but um, until, um, I, I just want to, paint that, uh, to point that until really very recently, sir, there were no catalogs uh, in, in the country, just only uh, abroad with the exhibits. But you, you sort of underestimate their um, international um, locatedness. I mean, these guys do travel now, so and in the last decade, sir, if they were exhibited all over the world, so they know what they're doing and they're much more knowledgeable about sort of the, uh, the art history as well. So yes, like sort of, you can, like they do know about Baltanski, they do know about Richter and, and many others. So in other words, like sort of, it's now it's much more dialogical. That's why I'm sort of interested in the 90s and sort of earlier work when it was kind of like you know the indigenous kind of material uh, that still kind of devoid of this sort of intertextual uh, references that the postmodernist art usually would have. Yes, please. Just introduce yourself. I understand from you that if people use the post colonialist uh, framework, if we don't, as academics, maybe need a new uh, term also to describe things that, as my name, for example, kind of described, they are not exactly the typical uh, post colonialist uh, feeling. Mm -hmm. For example, a country like uh, Montenegro, would we call it a post colonial uh, Maybe some people there speak of freeing up themselves mm -hmm. up from Belgrade. Or now, if Catalonia would gain independence, is it exactly post-colonial, or is it some people who want to mm -hmm. take, keep their wealth and keep their culture? Just is it more kind of similar to maybe <coughs> outright uh, uh, white nationalist movements? A lot of things are happening now which are not exactly these people under pressure that want to uh, uh, to, to free up, <coughs> but it's the opposite actually. People mm -hmm. want to free up to stay unique themselves. And the, the people I met from uh, from uh, Belarus, met, I, I met mostly Jews, so maybe I didn't meet them. <laughs> Jews from Belarus maybe have a different narrative, but th their stories of Belarus, of Minsk, of Pinsk, was always, this is the real Russia. We, it's not like Moscow, full of Uzbeks and full of uh, Tatars. We are the real essence of the real Russian poetry, the real Russian. So it didn't feel like this is a very post-colonial country, but actually the opposite, kind of like, let's keep Russia the way it was and keep the Tatars out. Right, but see, but that's precisely it. So you have um, uh, one group that says that Belarus is like Russia, right? And you don't think it's you don't think it's colonial. You don't see it as, as problematic. It's not Russia. So Russia is a different country. No, no, I mean, sir, they don't see it as problematic, right? So, and sir, you do have more and more people who do see it as problematic. No, it's not Russia, it's something else. And yes, sir, what we see here again and again, and that's what this kind of type of colonialism makes uh, especially clear, is that sort of, yes, we have groups that might uh, uh, rely, say, on Russian language, sort of to express their ideas, but sort of they still do not necessarily think about themselves as Russian. So language becomes less and less relevant. Right as a as a marker of your ethnicity or at least like national belonging. So, but another sort of your larger point I think is um, more interesting, namely, uh, what do we do uh, um, analytically and kind of epistemologically with the situation when the um, post-colonial framework has been monopolized by a very particular sort of vision of history? Again, like sort of going back to the question, sir, when we have only one 
sort of normative empire, right? That is sort of like, I don't know, British, right? And so everything else has either to fit into this framework or just be forgotten. And that was true about, say, Russian empire. So we have a very similar situation with the Austro-Hungarian empire. So the analytics is not the same, not as robust as with the other areas, right? So why? And so there is extremely little, almost no dialogue between the scholars of the overseas empires and the other ones. And to me, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, we could have a long discussion about that, but sort of I just don't want to accept these terms as, um, uh, as um, uh, normative ones. I have two questions. One's technical and one's conceptual, and I think they're very closely related. Okay. The first rather technical question is I was wondering how these images are in fact presented, consumed, or experienced as separate prints exhibited in gallery mm -hmm, spaces mm -hmm. for the public at large or printed in volumes in mm -hmm. mass, uh, <coughs> mass circulation. Mm -hmm. So my more conceptual question is whether the photographers themselves, the artists themselves, conceive of what they're doing as a pedagogical project, mm -hmm. in teaching the public how to look and to think and to know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's about the past or about Belarus today. And I don't know if those are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. So that's one question. Yeah. The presentation is, is an interesting issue. Um, it's, it's abysmal. Uh, they have a set of prints where they exhibit, like, and, and they have, as, as I mentioned, there, there are a couple of independent galleries where you could do that. And uh, when I was there, I started going there uh, in 1989, and I have been going like all these times. Uh, and you would get sometimes an exhibit in um, a hallway of um, a, um, a cinema theater, sometimes in a library, that kind of stuff, right? Um, then uh, they migrated to the web. Uh, and then there are some things, but for instance, like uh, this, this piece comes out as an article and I contacted like the other day Savchenko for uh, good quality prints like of these um, shadows, which I quite like actually. Um, and he said he doesn't have any Good um, digital, yeah. This any good digital things are like has off prints only, and that's it, right? So they're still very much into kind of like very strange situation when they do not really popularize this sort of, and I, I find it strange. Uh, but if, um, another interesting thing is uh, with the found photography, like Kazimierkin. I, I don't talk about this. I uh, didn't talk about this uh, project, but he has a v really interesting um, um, series called uh, Children's Album. So he found uh, reels of, um, um, how do you call them, photo reels, like sort of um, the, the, the old style, uh, by his parents' um, uh, home. Um, um, and he looked at them, and they turned out to be uh, official portraits of um, uh, kids in kin kindergarten. So he started developing them. Uh, and they all, <laughs> it's funny, they all dressed like either princesses or like Russian princesses, you know, with like this crown or whatnot, um, or hussars, right? And he published initially, and then um, I traced like all the publications. Initially, he published like sort of few um, uh, um, images with um, the perforation and everything, but they were individual, um, and they were quite interesting. So you, you see these kids who are who are still learning how to pose and that sort of stuff, and sort of you read them differently. And then he published colored, and all of them, like um, out of 200, he picked 15, right? And suddenly, when it comes as a series, so you see the profound similarity in monotony of the dresses, of the poses. So the circulation, as you asked, like circulation actually matters. So like in what way they decide sort of to present the art. And I don't think they are that conceptual yet. They're still thinking, even though um, both Savchenko and Kazimierkin, they have teaching uh, courses. So they do teach locals how to read photography, but also how to do it. I, I presented this talk in Moscow um, um, in January, and there were a couple of photographers. And actually, I sent it, the Russian version to Kazimierkin. And their uh, reaction was interesting. They said, uh, it's, I didn't expect that. They said, that's great, because you placed us in the context. Right? They didn't have anything against or in favor of the method that sort of I, I, well, the framework I created, but they really liked the idea of being at least in some context, because otherwise, I guess, like, sort of nobody is writing about them. Yeah. Yes, Roy. My name is Roy. I'm uh, researching uh, history teaching in Israel. Mm -hmm. And um, 
if they are truly so popular, I, I would accept, it, especially their historical point of view or their attitude, uh, history with that origin of you know, undermining the um, ethnic or national uh, narrative. So I would accept they would then um, receive like this um, objection or this criticism. And so maybe you can elaborate on that. I don't think there is much, but I, I don't think they are sort of uh, much criticism, but I don't think sort of they are mainstream um, um, authors either. What saves them uh, is that they all have, all, all the ones I talked about, they all have sort of international reputation now. So their works have been published in international catalogs and sort of it, it's widely exhibited. It was like in the 90s especially. So that kind of created the authority, the position of authority from which they speak. So. But yes, the major discourse now is quite different. It, it is about sort of the production of um, a particular nation state. So, and they uh, kind of managed to assume uh, this uh, borderline position. Oh, well, not borderline. I mean, sorry, they're not interested. In, I asked with Savchenko, it's interesting. So I asked him, so like, do you think about yourself as a Belarusian artist? He said, no, 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 I'm an artist from Minsk. Well, right. that's not surprising. <laughs> Yeah, now, now imagine, so I'm coming into this uh, after my work, uh, field work in Russia, yeah, right? So like everything is so different. So that's why sort of I thought, well, okay, I have to talk about that because I, in Russia you just, don't, you just don't see it this way. Like I, yeah. at least I don't and I, I do pay attention. Yeah, but, but um, and, and I mean, I guess, but still it's in some way they are exposed to this narrative building in Russia, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not because, I mean, it's so different in a way and is it not like, there is no kind of dialogue or some sort of kind of osmosis of ideas because still, I mean, it's, uh, it's fairly, I mean, there is a lot of traveling between the two and probably there is still a lot of kind of personal networks and, and it is very strikingly different. And actually, I have another kind of <coughs> side question to that is uh, in some way, in a very vague way, it reminds me of kind of late Soviet living outside, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. kind of removing yourself from this political discourse in a way that you can <coughs> make art, in a way that you can, you know, construct personal experiences, and not being inside the ideology, not being inside the big ideological debate, and, mm -hmm. you know. It's a very Soviet thing to do. Uh, late Soviet. Late Soviet, yeah. yeah. Yeah, except sort of there is one difference. They're doing it like when the Soviet Union is kaput, right? It's collapsed, right? So, and for me, that's the interesting question. So, why do the, why why would you do that, given the range uh, range of options that you have? Like after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you still go back to the Soviet records, and then you do rearrange them precisely in the way that you mentioned, namely, sort of like that's why sort of um, the cyclic nature for me is crucial because they have enough means kind of to build an, a long narrative, and like in the album of the real Soviet of real life, uh, uh, right, um, of Kazimierz, you don't have any political life at all. It's mostly, except for the Troika when it's military codes, but otherwise it's just daily life. And that's sort of the real life that they want to see, the real past that they want to see. If no, these public celebrations, like nothing, You're just like swimming, I don't know, eating and that sort of stuff, right? So, and it, it, yes, is it Soviet? Yes, it is, but it's also sort of a critique of the dominant Soviet narrative of the time when it was indeed like sort of political and, you know, and so, but it has to be about either Stalin or like now about Putin. But the Russian stuff, it's interesting, it doesn't quite exist this way. So like they barely, they are not known in Russia and they barely travel there. They're not really interested. So they're much more known in the Baltic states. So the center of gravity changes now. So they go to Vilnius often, they go to Poland often, <laughs> uh, but sort of Russia is not their main concern. In Russia, I think sort of the visual art there just went in a very different direction. So. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.